this meeting is being recorded. Over to you, Mr. Neil. Where is everyone? Yeah, Oh, there is people. All right. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've got, what have we got? We've got 16 people. We've got loads of people. Um, everyone popping up on the screens. Good to see you. And um, just before we start, ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Paul O'Neill. Tony is in the corner. You can see, give us a wave, Tony. I do. Um, Max Coates is unfortunately not going to be with us tonight. Um I can't be bothered with him, so I've basically thrown him out before we've started, which is a shame. No, I'm joking. I'm just going to text him. It's five past seven. No wonder this lad is never in touring cars because he probably wouldn't turn up for his seat fit. Hurry up. Oh, oh, there's, there's someone called Max Coates in the waiting room. Shall, shall I let him in or shall we let him sweat it and wait for a while? Should we, let, should, we sweat, should we sweat him? Yeah. Let, let's let him sweat for him. He's, he's got he's not here. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's not. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, good to see you all. Um, I'll say I'm Paul. Tony's in the corner. Well, he's in the corner of my screen anyway. A couple of things. Um, love the show to bits. So it's an hour-long show. We talk about all aspects of mental health. We meet, we share, we just talk about everything that's hopefully positive in your lives and also we can talk about the negatives as well which is um fantastic as well we talk about absolutely anything so it's cool um sorry about last week it was a bit busy for us both wasn't it toe um but this is now is, it, is this the 12th it episode is. of this it is number 12. yeah it's the 12th isn't it um which is fantastic um and yeah just for me i'm we, you don't even need to know this, but I'm going to tell you. I'm in Oxford in my mate's bedroom. So um, some people you'll know, Chris may know uh, Hannah Bevan, and also Sh um, Shaz might know Hannah Bevan. Hannah works for BMW. Um, is one of the uh, the guys who runs all of the events for touring cars and um, and also Goodwood Festival of Speed and everything. So I've dropped by um, because I was on my way somewhere else as well. Uh, well, I'm at Castle Coon tomorrow, so I just basically dropped by. And she said, come in and um, you can have your tea. Uh, and you can also use my dad's my dad's office. Look at this. <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> this is the that is the best thing ever, isn't it? So yeah, guys, hello and welcome. It's uh, it's really good to see you. So Tony, I've done enough talking as usual, and I'll let you have a crack, mate. Yeah. So a few new faces this week. So for those of you new to the show and to our regulars who will know what it's all about, every week we speak to guests from the world of sport and entertainment and we ask them about their plans for the year ahead. We have a little look back on their highlights of their career and we explore with those stars and with you, the Positive Pit Stop crew, uh, aspects of mental health. And we look at how you might uh, improve your mind as, as well as your body looking after your well-being hopefully we'll have a bit of fun doing that and we'll all learn a few tips from some fun and laughter um, we try to make the show as interactive as possible so if you're happy to put, switch your camera on please do because it always looks great to see as many people smiling laughing or frowning depending on what Mr O'Neill is asking and saying um, and at the bottom of your screens, you'll see the chat facility. Um, just pop any questions, comments or thoughts as the show goes on. And we may well get you on screen uh, asking those questions. Towards the end of the show, we have a bit of a, a free for all open question thing. Um, I have to point out tonight that um, unfortunately scrutineering, um, as Mr Coates didn't arrive for signing or, or for scrutineering, we're going to have to have him on mute uh, for the first 10 minutes and I really do apologise but I'm going to have to ask Mr O'Neill the blooming question that everybody will be wanting to ask is last week Paul you said you really like social media 99% of it is absolutely positive. So what's been the experience now you've done Celebrity Gogglebox? Do you still love it? Uh, my <clears throat> I'll be honest, actually, just quickly, I, nothing's changed for me. If people don't know, I was on um, Celebrity Gogglebox, but that's not because I'm a celebrity. It's because my sister is a celebrity and I was a bolt-on and she wouldn't do it without me. So that's why 
I come under the banner, it should be celebrities and their siblings or people you've never heard of. Anyway, so social media, I've always think I've always thought is a fantastic tool. Um, I'm lucky because I did put a tweet out actually, Tony. Don't know if you've seen it, and I, uh, I know Chris may have seen it, but I put a tweet out just saying, you know, uh, thanks for uh, all the support and all the nice messages. My tweets are my tweets because the people who follow me, they never give me any grief, which is just that's probably what keeps me on Twitter, especially. Um, I didn't get any massively horrible things said about me or to me. Um, I did get some grief, um, but it was only if you search for it, which I never did. It was my friends who I go cycling with, they were screenshotting stuff and sending it me. And it, it, there was actually some not very nice stuff at all. And some people were saying that there was some stuff on Instagram's goggle box that wasn't very nice either. But I don't look at that because I can't be asked. So, so yeah, mate, my, my view's not changed. I think I said on here, didn't I, that there might be a time when I come on here and it's, I'll be saying a different story. I don't know how people are going to perceive me. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, mate, to answer your question, I'm, I'm not particularly bothered, to be honest. Uh, um, I'd be massively bothered if something big come up and they were just being horrible about me. Yeah, that goes for any human being, I think. Um, yeah. And it will change the way that you maybe think, mate. But, yeah, that to, to answer your question, it's not, you know, it, if you want to search for it, that I, I had a problem, actually. The newspapers picked up on something I said. I was on the one show and they picked up on something I said, joking, and they made my life a bit of a misery, actually. And then someone sent me the comments from that and they were disgusting. Laughable to a point, but disgusting. It just reminded me of the 90s. That's all it was. So, so yeah, mate, to all of those <laughs> lot. <laughs> Let's face it, none of us really want to remember the, the 90s, certainly not the early ones. <laughs> Not at all, man. That's, that's, but that is that is really nice to hear and I think a lot of actually that's really valuable advice as well that if you don't read it then it can't harm you can it no there's enough people there's enough people in this world that will not like every single one of us and you're never going to please everybody in life and that doesn't matter and what you I remember Jack Benyon saying to me, who comes on the show quite a lot, he said he said something to me like, you know, you'll only remember the, the horrible things that people say. You hardly ever remember the nice bits. So luckily for me, I only see the nice bits and I'm going to keep it that way. I don't go searching for, for the dross because I wouldn't do it to anyone else. So I don't see why they should do it to us. So that's, that's just the yeah. way it is. Well, on another note, Tony, how nice is it I didn't know which one was Max Coates because there's so many pictures of him. I was thinking, is he in Shazza's bedroom? Is he in bed with Chris? That's a bit weird. Or is Robert Marsh took him hostage? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Everywhere. I feel left out. I should have put a picture of him on the back here. <laughs> there you go. Ah, there talk, talk about our is that me, me, Benjamin. And Max. Is, is that... Is that it is that is. me, Benyon? Me, Benyon, and Max? It is by the wonderful Laura J, artist. Yes. Who, who <gasps> actually drew you that. Great North Run. Day. To do the Great North Run, which of course was cancelled. So, in terms yes. of artistic license, I think you mentioned that when Max agreed to come on tonight, he, you were relieved that finally we had a guest who would make your hair look quite lush, shall we say. <laughs> Talk about artistic license. <laughs> so, no. Hey, you no, know I love about Laura. Laura always gives me, hey, Matt, Laura always gives me more hair than I've got on any picture. She just makes me have more hair than I've got. And I absolutely love that about her. And a shout out to Laura. She sent me a lovely card. I've been that flat out. She sent me a moon pig card with, with, a, with some really nice messages in it before Gogglebox started. Um, and I, I need to I need to give her a shout. Actually, she said I've been a bit quiet on social media, but I'll speak to you soon. So you just reminded me, mate, that I will put that in my notes to ring her because she's a proper proper woman. She is. Sure. But yeah, we're very lucky to have our friends. Mate. We're very lucky to have our yeah. friends. You know what? Um, we've made him sweat for nearly fifteen minutes. Do you want to? Do you want to bring <laughs> him in and introduce him? <laughs> you better add because I feel terrible because it's like people pitch up. 
because there's a certain person on the show and all they get is me chatting absolute rubbish and the guests just sat there going, mm, can I come in? So Max Coates, everybody, um, he's a top lad. Um, I was lucky enough to interview him uh, when he won his, his race at his home circuit. I think it was his first Clio Cup win from what I remember. And he had me crying near enough, which was lovely. Um, but enough of that. We'll speak about that later. Max Coates, um, first of all, my man, how are things? Good. Do you know what? I am so happy to go going racing where there's actual people. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm re I'm really really excited for for not only this year but this weekend. I don't think I've been this excited about a season since I started back in 2016 in Clio's. It's so. a big statement that it's a big statement that Max because I've just done a I've just previewed Snetterton Touring Car um, the Snetterton Touring Car Championship for my little YouTube channel. I've got Matt Neal on it to preview it. And I was asking him about the fans um, coming back. And he was, to be fair, he was saying how cool it is because to be fair, I think we take fans for granted, don't we, a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think we forget, especially people like me and you, who I think relate to the fans because we're not multi-millionaires. They blow us along a bit, don't they? Yeah, definitely. It's... Um... I think what I've probably like got that feeling of is when when we're kind of like building up for this season and my sponsors are getting excited about it. I've got that same level of excitement as like doing our back to our first year when we did Clio's in 2016 because I think it's everybody's kind of had like a lull away from it and it's now like all exciting that we're going racing again. Where you know when it when it sort of like goes one year to the next, it's always exciting. We're always going racing, but it, th there's no change there's no difference but where, like this year there is people can come back again and when you when you look at all of these pictures like of of of, of people of me there isn't really a lot of it going on where there isn't somebody else in the picture as well and that probably tells you the story that you need to know about what what racing is like for me so um you know if, if when people aren't there it, it's just not as good so yeah do you know what I find, though? I was at British GT the other week working for one of the teams, just doing some social media, and it was just unreal how much of an impact it was to my psyche to see yeah. other people. It was as if I wanted to question why they were there. Isn't it funny how the brain works? It's how you evolve. Like we have been bred now to evolve that it's wrong to see people together. That's a proper worry that is, to be yeah. honest. And you've seen everybody with a face mask on. So um, yeah, like seeing groups of people is just cool. So like you're actually like walking up to go through to the paddock and there's like actual people stood around the outside at Paddock Hill. And um, yeah, it's just... Um, it's just good to have it back, isn't it? And that's 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 the cool bit. I think that the only the only thing is with the fans coming back, the only thing you can say is it's just positive. It's just positives, full stop. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's positive. It's positive for the fans because a lot of people. I've always said this about motorsport. It's such a niche that the people that go and watch it, I find, are people that go to escape real life. Yeah. And watch cars go around a track and full on battles they get i can't think of i only think of football which is massively tribal and there's a bit more to it but motorsport fans are there for the not saying football fans are bad people but they're there for the for me for the right reasons yeah you know to support i know football fans support but sometimes it gets a bit out of hand you never see a massive riot at a motorsport event you? you don't you don't get someone at le mans giving the v's to a driver going i hate you you effing you know what i mean you don't see it yeah. No, it's, um, I think people are there for the right reason. And like you say, like I, I go into my own little bubble when I leave. So like we, we stay in a motorhome. I don't like really staying at hotels when, I, when I'm racing myself. I like to stay at the track because I kind of think like as soon as I get in the motorhome, it's just like an escape. Like I leave home, that's it. I'm away. I'm away until Sunday night. And to be honest, if World War Three could set off outside of Snetterton Gates, I'd be wrong to say I don't care, but like I, it doesn't it doesn't affect me whilst I'm in Snetterton. I'm in my own little bubble, and um, you know that even goes for like Croft when I'm seven miles down the road that way, and I'm like 
I don't want to come home. I want to stay at the track. It's part of the experience. And um, so, yeah, I, to- I totally, totally get what you mean about being in your bubble and, and going away and doing it, doing it for all the right reasons. And, um, you know, what, when, when you talk about what this is all about in, in, in terms of um, mental health, it, mm. it gives, gives me that in a, in, a, in a big way, being away and absolutely love it. Mm. I think this is a massive step, step, not towards normality and that I don't know what's going to happen in the future, you know, what this roadmap's going to entail or what's going to happen. I actually have to ask people um, who watch the news because I don't, so I don't actually know what's happening. I only a bit selfishly look at what is going to affect my job. That's the only yeah. thing I look at. But this is a massive step in the right direction, um, obviously for race fans to get there, but just... You're you know, like me, you're never, just, you're never at home watching a telly when the news is on. We, when are you no. ever at home at eight or six? I'm on I'm on the road, <laughs> like every yeah. day. And the only days when I'm not on the road at eight and six, I kind of want to be in bed at them times. <laughs> so yeah. well, but that's the thing, isn't it? And, yeah. and, and that's, yeah. that's probably why we're so positive is because we don't see any news. <laughs> you know, it, 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 sorry if anybody here like loves news, but like it does my head in. I just think I think we should have like so much positive stuff on the news to like counteract all the crap that goes on. It'd be great. Interestingly, Max. So, and I hate, please don't people think that I'm just going to start talking about Cogglebox or all this stuff, but it's relative to me. So yeah, this filmed the second episode um, mm. last night in London and um, me and my sister were sat there and we were dreading any news coming on because the first one didn't show any news. The second one we did last night, they shown the news, mate. Right. And me and Armel are very much the same. We're just, we don't like the news. We need, if we need to know what's going on, we'll take bits of it. But you know, Max, this is horrendous, mate. Armel was like, this is just going to be a COVID fest. I don't want to watch it. And yeah. the producer was like, okay, well, we'll still have to watch it if that's all right. And we ended up having a chat about it. And it will be interesting to see what they edit out of what we were talking about because Which, I thought there was uh, really interesting stuff, mate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see how um, how things get spun, you know, to, to, to always, I think I think the news, I don't know if this is what we're going to go on about, but like over the past 18 months, whatever anybody has done, there's always been a counteraction. Nobody, mm. it's very rare where people have actually gone, well done, that was good. You know, so, and, and I think there needs to be more of that in the world. Like that's what, that's what, that's what. It's good. You know, why would you know? Well, it- that's what I was going to say, Max, is that for me, and this might just be an out of the out of the world stupid thing to say, but I'll just say it. I think with the news and things like that, that it's the only media platform I can think of that that's really unbalanced. Like when it comes to journalism in sport, you need to be balanced and give two sides to a story. Yeah. Uh, news, mate, it's speculatist, it's speculatism, it's it's like tabloids even the bbc can be very much tabloidy yeah. and the problem i have is that they should for me and they don't know if it work they should have a percentage of good news stories in there because I, I i don't agree. ever see i don't see somebody saving a cat out of the tree you know no. i want to see that <laughs> it makes makes me go like so we'll go on about coronavirus and then we'll go on about how people are suffering with mental health from it and then we'll continue about bad stuff. And like, well, no wonder everybody's bloody depressed. Oh, yeah, he's crap. Like, just put some happy on. Like, funny. Yeah. Just do that. You know, it, life's still going on. People have still got a smile on their face. Maybe not all the time, but like, let's just have something to be mm-hmm. to be happy about. And just, uh, I just guess for us that this weekend, that's racing, isn't it? Just on that point, yeah. as an old geezer, ITV, ITN News always used to have and finally and it was always a fun happy story I don't know if this, if they do it now but that was Good. always always fun yeah it should happen very true Way back. yeah very true it should it did and do you know who's the guy who I don't know if anybody watches it, is it on BBC3 um, is it called Good News or yeah oh, what is his, I can't remember what it is Yes, he's a comedian. Russell yeah. Howard. Or, oh. Russell Howard. And at the yeah. very end of it, thanks, I think that was Darren, wasn't it? Thanks, Darren. At the very end of it, he comes out with a 
just a cracker at the end. And you're just like, it brings you back to what being a human's about. And I've said this before, it's not all about being happy because you can't be 100% happy. That's what that, that would make the world stop. You can't do that. But yeah. still, I think we're getting to the point where everyone's 100% unhappy. So, so we need to just balance it up and, and like, no, that's a random feature we can bring into ITV. <laughs> Don't, mate, the random features I've asked ITV to do, they've said a stone wall no. So I, we've got no chance, mate. Um, right, moving on, my man. Mm-hmm. Great motorsport this year for you. Um, second year in... This is second year in minis, isn't it? Yeah, it's second, second year in minis. Um Last year was kind of a bit of a non-year, I think, really, in mm. in, in in many ways. Um, for, for for me, I can't remember whether Knockhill was our second. I think it was our second. So we did Donington, Knockhill, Snetterton, somewhere else. Right. I'll be really honest. Like last year for me was, it just wasn't the same. So like, it's not very many times where I'm like, I can't quite remember where. Where everything was, but I think Knock Hill was our second round. I had a coming together with Ant Water Neils. Um, I remember we spoke know, about it, didn't we? Yeah, you know, there's plenty of people had their their opinion one way or the another, which is fair enough. Um, but it kind of ruined my year. And t- to be honest, after that, I probably lost a bit of motivation um, because I wasn't really going for a championship. So, what you know, when when for like the last four years in Clio's, I've all, the first year maybe not, but like every other year I've been battling for a championship and it was a really, really different thing for me to be at a racetrack with not necessarily the same purpose that I've been with for the last three years. It's a really different mm-hmm. mindset to come with. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's the second year of Clio's. Um, the whole reason of going with Graves Motorsport is because I want to drive in the BTCC. And that is very much their plan and intention for the future. So mm. I'm I'm hoping that I'm here for the long term. I know I've said that at the beginning of a lot of years with a lot of different teams, but um, yeah, having having been around and understood what it takes to get into touring cars, I think I'm in a good place for that. Probably not mm. for the really near future, but um, maybe in a couple of years down the line. So there's, there's a bit of a long term plan. Yeah, that sounds like a, that's the. I think that's the way to do it. I think people lose sight of, you know, their ambitions to be in British touring cars because it's not a, a switch that you flick. Like you found out, you know, you had a, a one-off out in at, at Croft. I remember, yeah. um, and I'm sure you thought that was going to lead to, you know, more more yeah. things. But it's supposed to. sometimes <laughs> it, just, it well, yeah, but sometimes it just doesn't happen, yeah. and it's a it's a weird one to yo-yo from support to touring cars and then try and get back up there isn't it but yeah it is for me looking looking from the outside in i would say it would make you a better person when you got there again yeah i um i think so i had a really great experience when i did it and it's probably i think when you when you look at a lot of people of a similar age to me who've done the support races there's a lot of us who are now coaching and doing similar work to what to what you do in the coaching world and a lot of them are either now not racing on their own personal steam they're only racing with a in kind of like two you know partnered championships where they're driving with somebody else um mm. but i think having had that that chance to drive in touring cars is is you don't forget that um so for me the, there is still that massive hunger to to get back and and probably why i'm um yeah 20, 27 and still like all i want to do is race a touring car what <laughs> everything else kind of pales into insignificance. That's what I want to do. So, um, yeah, maybe a bit single-minded, but um, I think having that in 2015 definitely gives me that drive to, to come back and try and do it. Yeah, well, definitely. You can't, I can't believe it's that long ago. That's absolutely crazy. I just yeah. think that, you know, if you, don't, if you don't have that single-mindedness, especially at the top level, that's something, and I've said it in the past, the single-mindedness is something I never, ever, ever had. I was just happy to be there i was never going to be a champion i knew that from day dot but when i had my chance i give it my best and that's you know, that's why i had a few podiums that that that's what i did but i never could string along the championships i never had the single-mindedness of somebody like you i remember 
I don't even know what year it was, Max. I remember going down the pit lane for an open day at Croft. I reckon it was 2012. I was there testing the Toyota for Speedworks because I was doing a one-off round at Knock Hill. Yeah. And I, you were yeah, there. You were there with the Genetta G50. You were there with the Genetta G50. And I always remember this. And I always tell people, you were there. You had a big table outside. You had your trophies on there, proudly showing them off. There was sponsors and other people that were there and you were courting them. And I was thinking that lad, that that's what that means to that, that lad. Yeah. You'd never get me doing that because it, it never meant that much to me. That for you, it's a single minded, I'm going to get there. Yeah. It's what I want to do. I, I remember, I can't remember which year it was. I think it was either the year that Shedden or, or a Turkington year that, that they won the, the championship and you know, like when, when you're at Brands and everybody's there at the final round and there's loads of people around the podium and it's like, and the champion is whatever and the things go off and it's all great. And I was like walking along, like well away from it with my mum. And I was like, one day, mum, I'm, that's going to be me on there. And like, like really meant it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm doing that. I haven't got a clue out, but I've got to do it. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, that's the last I, plan. And I know it's not around the corner. But um, I'm more than happy to put a few years hard graft into to making it, giving it a crack, you know. I absolutely love that, mate. And that's that's what that's what we come back to when when you get it done, mate. Whenever that's going to be, we come back to that moment, don't we? And um, yeah, yeah, I've had a few little moments like that, and but a lot of it is what we talk about on the show with with Sarah and Danny, and that's the the mindset side of things and the the manifesting. And you know the creative visualization side of things as well. So yeah, it's um it's all there, mate. I absolutely love it. Um, tell me then, uh, Snetter, you're actually pretty. I think you're pretty decent around Snetter, aren't you? I yeah. remember you're always up the front in Cleos or Minis. We've had some good results there. Uh, we definitely won. I can remember a race in the wet. We've won there. We've had a lot of podiums. Um, I think, I think the only win was probably one in the wet. Um, in Cleos, I've had a lot. I had one where I should have won it. <laughs> We've all had them. Um, I was I was leading and got hit and had a punch at last lap. So it was kind of all but there really. Um, so yeah, we we've had we've had good pace at Snetterton. Um I think it's a good track for me, and, and hopefully we we go okay really. Yeah. Last question for me, mate. Um, how's the testing been going? I'm always interested in the testing. You can always tell by how somebody reacts to this question. Um, I know. The guys at uh, Graves will know what the score is. You got Bradley, um, yeah, as your team. Bradley, Bradley Gravitt's my teammate, which yeah. is another good draw to the team and to and to the whole touring car program. Um, so his his dad was ninety British touring car champion. Um, yeah, actually, I stayed at Bradley's house the other week, and there's some bloody cool trophies there. Like at the, you like. There's some trophies I wouldn't mind having in my uh, my mantelpiece when I'm uh, a bit older. So um, yeah, he's he's a great addition to the team. Rob's been super helpful in terms of um, setup and a lot of experience uh, that he brings to it, and and hopefully is also part of what will happen in the future with with touring cars. Should open up a lot of doors, mm -hmm. but um, testing's gone okay. Um, I would have liked another day if if I'm really honest, but. Um, the the reason that I'd like another day is because we're fairly restricted in terms of uh, tire regs with Mini Challenge. So we get ten new tires at the start of the race weekend, uh, which which we have to carry through the Friday. So essentially, any running we do Friday starts to eat out of our tire allocation. So if we had if we had Friday as a free day, I'd be like, we're we're mega. We're we're going to be absolutely bang on it. Um, where we don't, there's maybe a little bit of things that we may still be trying and working out and testing, but I think we're somewhere near. Yeah. I, can I just ask, actually, how much does 10 tyres cost? Um, how much does what, sorry? 10 tyres cost? Uh, it's about two and a half grand. Jesus Christ. I, do you know what's really bad? I only asked that question because I, I know nothing about the cost of this, like nothing, like anymore. Yeah. Yeah, That's so not, to give you an idea, we've got um, we've got ten so ten slicks for this weekend and eight wets, just in case it's not supposed to rain. But yeah, it, 
we had four and I was like, right. look, if, what, what happens if the weather changes? The problem is if you don't have them and something happens, you're then like, oh, I ain't got any wets. How stupid does it look if you, you go into the extent of spending all this money and then you go, well, we would have won that race, but we didn't have any new wets. So yeah. mm-hmm. you you got to have it. So um, fortunately, it's... it gets credited back. <laughs> um, oh, but, you, uh, get, you get credited back because wets, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, they're more expensive than slicks. Yeah, by maybe fifteen pounds, something like that. It's not fifteen even, quid. Yeah, rip off. Yeah, I know it's not. It's <laughs> not a, when they're two hundred and fifty pound a tire. Then, yeah, I think. Um, oh. I think I've probably grown to try and just worry less about the the the, the financial side of things because you know, from a mental health side, it, it's proper taxing mm. doing all this. It's um. Mm. You know, if if you if you scrutinise every penny, it's proper proper stressful. Mm. Do you know what, Max? That's such a good point, mate. People won't ever think about that. I know Sarah races, and she'll tell you. You know, she'll probably say the same as you. I remember in 20, 2009 in the Sunshine Integra, the first year I come back, I got told that if we cracked the bumper. Which was seven hundred and fifty quid to put it to get you get them out of the mold seven hundred and fifty quid from Dynamics. If we cracked one of them at the weekend. We couldn't afford to put a new one on. Yeah. So I went through races one and two at Snetterton, not cracking the thing, and then I just smashed into Andrew Jordan. I waited till I could see him, and then just drilled him because I knew that that bumper was done anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like that is mad, like. I remember when I drove the touring car, somebody asked me this question the other day and they were like, um, was it insured? I was like, I don't know. I've got honestly no idea. Uh, I didn't crash, so it was all right. I don't know what would have happened if I had, but um, yeah. And then there's, but I think like, so Jeanette Juniors, they go through bonnets like nobody's business. Like I went out to, to Spain when Elite were testing out there. And they took bonnets out for testing in Spain. I was like, this is nuts. I did one bonnet in two years and was gutted when it was knackered. It's like 17 kilos heavier. And I, I actually remember at Alton, I smashed it to bits. And um, the somebody had, um, there was somebody who was a big fan of mine and a marshal had found this piece of the car and it was the last bit that we needed to fix it. And like, we couldn't really, we couldn't afford a new bumper. It was like 1500 quid. So um, we were like scratching our heads, like what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And somebody came round and they were like, I think the other bit of that is in our tent over in the campsite. And they brought it back and we managed to get it patched together um, like Sunday morning and, and got back out. But it was, you know, the whole, most of my racing career has been, you know, like that where you're like, don't crash it because we're screwed if you do. <laughs> so uh, yeah. You, you I, know, I might go, don't worry about 15 quid on a tyre, but it, yeah, we, we, all, we all still look at the budgets and have a pretty good idea as to what's going on. Yeah, if there's anyone that's new to motorsport or who doesn't understand what motorsport's about, that last thing that Max has just said about that bumper, that sums up proper racers versus people whose dads and mums and family pay for it all through their career. That's exactly what it's about. Love it. Um, right, Toe. What thank, you got, Lid? Thank you, mate. Well, first of all, I think we've got a new feature coming next week, which will be Guess the Price Of. Um, and, uh, yeah, Ian Brown. Milk's about a quid, are we? Uh, just in case you didn't know the price of that. But we can do a whole feature next week. I'm sure Chris can uh, come up with some crap questions around it. Right, Max, first time I met you, I think, was on the banking at Croft. And you had probably turned up to watch either the Christmas stages or the Jack Frost stages. Yeah. And that was many, many years ago. And I think out of everyone who I've met in the racing community, probably between you and Creasy, I, I haven't met anyone who, who was more passionate about motorsport. You, you're obviously like a, a massive fan as well as just loving being part of the motorsport community. You just rock up everywhere where there's a race on, it seems at times. But what what was your actual journey into, into motorsport? What got you hooked and how did you get into it? Yeah, so my my introduction was through my dad, uh, Rob. He used to do rallycross 
and so yeah the motorsport runs in the family um i got a very very knackered old cart for christmas when i was maybe like four i think i had a motorbike before that and um and then yeah just kind of got into it and to be honest I never really intended to go racing it's never the who who makes that kind of plan when they're poor first of all but like Actually, you know, all these people are like, oh, yeah, well, it's all I've ever dreamed of. It's like, right, yeah, when you were four, that's all you dreamed about was going race for long car. But um, it was like, um, yeah, we got that, and then we went to go and do a test day with this, this other car. I reckon Dad knew there was, a, like, an ARCS, ARCS test going on. And, uh, yeah, just got the licence, went for it from there, and, um, yeah, got into it, did a few kart races, and then the, the Janetta Junior thing happened, like, eight or ten years later. Oh, by a bit of a stroke of luck, really. But you you make your own luck in motorsport, don't you? I mean, you work ultra hard to get your sponsorship deals and, and to go racing. So I'm sure it wasn't just a stroke of luck. No. What happened was like the end of my karting thing, like a lot of people who, I don't know anybody else here that hears about involved in karting, but a lot of the dads are always like, if you don't enjoy it, you stop. It costs a lot of money and... You know, if it's not right for you, then, then don't do it. And I got out of a, a cart end of one of the races at, at PFI, a big cart track in the UK. And I, it was probably like the fifth time I'd been fired off on the first lap of the race. And I just thought, I'm not having fun. I'm really, really not enjoying this. Um, so I said that to my dad, and that was quite a hard thing to do because it's, it's, it's all I'd ever known, like going racing. And then... Um, we were like, okay, so, you know, what if we stop? And then we sort of like looked down the car avenue and kind of went, if we could get somebody to buy the car, we could possibly run a Janetta Junior ourselves. Um, we've got a truck, we've got a workshop, we've got tools, we've got all that side of things. We could probably run the car on about the same cost as what we could run carting on. And to be honest, if we can't, then we'll try and make that work. Um, and... And yeah, so we, we basically said to one of one of my dad's um, friends, would you be interested in buying the car? We'll we'll kind of cover the the down the downside appreciation of it. Um, and he went, yeah, go on. And I, I remember being stood on our or sat on our staircase trying to listen into the conversation to see what would happen. And um, yeah, this this guy bought the car, and um, that's what got me onto to Toka Paddock, Paddock eleven years ago. And yeah, we're still going around in circles, trying to, trying to go as fast as I can ever since, really. That's, that's awesome. And, and I've mentioned, you know, how, how hard you work, and, and Paul alluded to it as well at, at events. You know, you, I've watched you at a number of, of TOCA meetings, and you're busy interacting with loads of fans of all ages. Um, you know, many who rock up with, with coats, t-shirts and hats and you name it and they want the photos and I've never ever seen you turn anyone down for a photo you're having yeah. to obviously deal with all your sponsors guests um which I'm sure at times is a bit of a distraction um you've got to keep your your team happy you've got to keep your sponsors happy which bits of that cause you stress and which bits are fun on a race weekend I think I'd be lying if I said any of it isn't necessarily stressful, but I enjoy it. There isn't any of the bits that I don't enjoy. Um, and actually, last year, probably one of the main differences that I noticed was that I actually had time um, on a race weekend. I've never really had that for the last few years. Um, you know, like actually came to like eight or nine o'clock at night and I wasn't still trying to sort tickets out for the next day or do something or do this or finish something off. So I actually had like time to do it in the day, which is quite nice. Um, but no, I, I enjoy it all. All of it takes up the time, but it's, it's, it's part of what happens if you go racing. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy sharing sharing my experience with everybody else. And, and hopefully, you know, that kind of passion that you, you've said hopefully rubs off on other people. So yeah, it's uh, be wrong if I didn't didn't share that with everybody else, really. But the, there's inevitably in motorsport, there's there's moments where you just ha must have so much frustration. I remember seeing you having a microphone stuck under your nose at Thruxton after a final chicane incident. 
Yeah. And and I was I was watching it and thinking that isn't the max I know. You were being so held back and restrained and very professional. I'm not saying you're not professional, but I could tell you would have said something very different as a fan to what you said as a driver. How, how do you cope with those disappointments and, and how do you de-stress from those? Well, you, you, you don't see the off-camera bit on that where um, I was wanting to rip the sill off and try and smash his head in, but um, that's not really acceptable on ITV4. So um, I, had to, I had to kind of compose myself and... Yeah, initially Louise like, can we do an interview? You know, no, I'm too, I'm too angry. Um, but yeah, you know, you, you, it's part of it, and you know, actually, I think that emotion is what people, people enjoy. Um, and actually, probably, 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 aside from my interview with with Paul when I won my first clear race, probably one of the best interviews I've ever done, um, and is one that's actually gained me quite a lot of credibility and, and credence with a lot of people. So. You know, when you when when you're looking for a you know a positive from every from every situation, that one was was pretty rubbish. But um, you know, I got a hell of a lot of support out of that, and um, without doubt, that's helped. That's helped as the the years have gone on. And you know, you, you you continue to learn. Um, and and away from motorsport, uh, I know you you did a um, do you do a, a diploma degree with Leeds Beckett University? Yeah, so I did a. I did a sports marketing degree with um, with Leeds. As, essentially, when when I was doing um, Jeanette Super Cup in twenty twelve, um, I tried to go for the KX Academy. I tried all sorts to keep my racing going, and it just wasn't really working. And I I kind of sat down and thought, you know what? How many marketing directors that are thirty five to fifty trust an eighteen year old with? a hundred grand to go racing so most of them get paid minimum wage at 18 that don't get paid a hundred grand to go and race a car like it when you think about it now it is completely berserk um yeah i was walking into meetings being like yeah i want a hundred grand to go racing this is how i'm going to make it work for you but it's really difficult to make somebody see that with somebody so young so i, I went to uni to get a sports marketing degree essentially to prove a point um, so that people would go, yeah, he's, he's got some credence in what he's saying. Um, he's got a degree to back it up. So, yeah, he must must be all right. We can trust him with some money and he'll go, go racing and, and promote our brand and, and more, more, more to the point, you know, generate some sales from it. So um, that, that was the whole point of going to uni. Fair, and fair play. Um, so what when you're not racing, what what is a normal day in the life of Max Coates? <laughs> normal day doesn't exist in the life of Max Coates. I don't, I don't think I could explain to you what a normal day is. Um, to, to paint a picture, I think like like Paul, I was home for about four days in, in May. Um, most of them were for like less than 24 hours, whereas more or less like unload a bag, reload a bag, go. So predominantly now for me, a lot of it is driver coaching. Um, as a normal day-to-day -day thing but like for example this week so i think my last day of coaching was friday um quite nicely it's fallen to give me kind of five days off to build up to snetterton which i knew was coming so i kind of ran myself flat out until last weekend took a proper chill pill over the weekend um chilled out and then i started started to get prepped for you know three days of prep now to get ready for snetterton so um yeah, there isn't there isn't a normal day. Everything is a bit manic. Um, I'm either at a racetrack coaching someone, trying to make them go fast and stay out of a wall, or I've got a, a list of things to do, and I just work my way through that. So that's pretty much that's pretty much life um, for, for me. Well, talking talking of manic and lists, uh, I'll hand you back over to Paul for a bit of a, a quick fire question session. <laughs> That was very interesting, Maxi Coates. Um, interesting, you know. I, I will say though, mate, I was so happy I was there to. I was only covering for Louise Gooden, I think, that weekend at Croft, and I think there was two things that happened that weekend. One of them was you winning that race, which was so emotional, it was amazing. But the other thing that happened as well, and I had to interview them both, was Colin and Jason Plato getting into each other in the Subaru team, spun him round. 
at Tower, and uh, and it was just it was crazy. But I I always I always remember I, I was just happy to be in that collect in the uh, part Ferme where you were mate because I was like please don't put the camera on me because I was well enough. You know what I'm like. It was hard work, mate. Um, and the other thing, Max, if anybody ever wanted to see um, how a professional deals with an absolutely shockingly shit weekend where you've been properly done over by somebody, in my opinion, um, at Thruxton, like you did, mate, the way you handled that was absolutely perfect. And I think that any racing driver who's having a grievance with someone should always go back to that example of how you just stay arm's length. This is how it is. It was perfectly done, mate. In my my humble opinion, I thought it was amazing because that could have turned really rubbish and nasty. Um, and I think that's why you got a bigger following because it got replayed and replayed on social, on, on ITV Motorsports Twitter. Um, and it was good to... It was good to see the, the the fallout from it, mate, which was very much in your favour and, and and pretty cool, mate. So that's one for everybody in life, I reckon. It's not all about going gung ho, lad. Um, right, that was pretty boring what I just said. So sorry about that. So here we go. What we'll do then? We'll, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get on to the it means nothing to everybody else, but it means a lot to me. So yeah. I was nearly crying then, and like I got no reaction. I can always count on Chris to back me up, but the rest of you, you just look like someone shot you. No, just, I, you know, like when you know, just to like hit, you know, you you hit on like when when this is all about mental health, you probably hit like my two biggest points of of me being either a massive high or a massive low, and and like that's what motorsport is. He's emotionally a massive roller coaster, mm. and it's it happens day to day, hour to hour. In you know, and you know, and Tony said about like what is a day like in normal life is a roller coaster of emotions that goes from you're going racing, you're not going racing, you're going racing, you're not going racing. It like the last hundred years has been like that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but like those those two points are like probably the best day of my life at Croft. It was awesome. Um, and then like, it's still an awesome day. So I was racing, but it was pretty frustrating <laughs> at Thruxton. So, yeah. It's, it's a very interesting point because I, I try to explain racing to people who don't watch it or whatever. They don't, they don't understand. I know, you know, it's always very important, I think, to a, to a driver to have a, a fantastic partner because you need somebody that's, in your corner whether that's your partner or your team manager or you know i was dead lucky i had some fantastic team managers who properly properly fought for fought for their own you know and 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 girlfriends like in the past when they have been racing and they've been supportive if you have an awful day they're just there for you it makes a difference doesn't it your mum and dad for example big, big time big time I, I remember some of the times like that where um i think it was uh, to 2018, and it all ended up going to court over the championship with Paul, uh, not <laughs> Paul O'Neill, uh, Paul Rivet. <laughs> you, you hadn't sent me to court. Um, Paul, Paul Rivet, and that was like, I'm, I don't really like the controversy. That was crap. Like, it's like, we're going to race and not go bloody court. This is mental. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, there's, there's times like that where you really need people to help you out. I remember that. I do. Um, Ian Brown, what's going on there, mate? You've got a VR thing on. Are you going to shoot me? It's like the Terminator's turned up. Grow up, mate. Uh, <laughs> actually, look quite cool. That. What is that? Was it? Was it a VR thing? Yeah. He, Ian does a bit of sim racing. I think. He, uh, unfortunately. Oh, does he? I think Ian muted me. Unfortunately, Ian. This does sound really bad, but like. Ian's actually got a sticker on yeah, I've there. Got, I've got a race in a minute. So I'm just going to stick my <laughs> VR on. <laughs> and listen, so. That's awesome. Oh, that's, he's, he's one of you and he's got that funny accent. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got uh, I don't live too far from Max. I live up in Hortonley Spring. So. All right, Alan Shearer, pipe down. What an accent <laughs> that is. I love that. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got, I've got a race, so I'll, I'll mute my microphone, but I'll just have you on in the background. Good luck. Oh, this is, look, good luck, Ian. This is amazing. GT3's at Long Beach, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> what a guy. 
they've got a Max Quarters Mini, but they've got the wrong livery in it. So <laughs> we get it right. That's amazing. I've got Max Quartz's me, but they got the wrong livery on it. Right. Max, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what you're doing? Quick fire stuff. Quick fire stuff. Right. It's get to know Max. Okay. Oh. Here we go. Favorite, favorite food, Max? Uh, lasagna. I thought you'd say carbonara. Last time I stayed at your house for the Great North Run, you absolutely smashed the pasta. Yeah, I smashed your carbonara. Um, you did, you destroyed yeah. it. But if anyone doesn't know, I stayed in his spare room and I did some horrible things in there. I've never told him. Favourite drink? Ooh, uh, oh. What's it called? Disarono and Coke. Obviously not on a race weekend. <laughs> um, current road car? Uh, BM420D. Motorway Ooh. matcher. Yeah. Ooh. Tell you're an instructor, mate. Yeah, get the big diesel out. Um, the two liter diesel we need a tow summer. <laughs> What's your dream car, lad? Um, Ferrari California, and not for me, but for my dad. Oh, mate, really? Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah, he, he was amazing. always wanted, wanted one of them. That's the first thing I'd buy if I won the lottery. How but, cool would that be? How cool would that be if you could just pitch up with one of them with a bow on it, mate? That'd be wicked, wouldn't it? <laughs> Wheel um, spin. Donuts. I'll probably <laughs> crack it. Turn the traction off, 90 left. Um, Favourite holiday destination? Um, Somewhere with snow. Skiing. 100%. Oh, that kind of snow. Uh, yeah. What about... Um, <laughs> 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 Blair, Blair, let's move swiftly on. Blair or Oasis? Uh, Oasis. Be careful how you do this one. Spice Girls or Little Mix? Spice Girls. Glad. Favourite ITV motorsport presenter? Obviously you. I just thought I'd take a bit of time to answer it. I'm not I too sure my Steve, bullshit. He always doesn't know. Never knows if I have. <laughs> Do you uh, say you... Steve? <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> right. Good answer. We like that. Um, oh, what's this? If you go Steve, oh, nobody every... can really argue with you. Nobody can go. <laughs> every Everybody loves Steve. Everybody. Do you know what I've just laughed at? Hey, Max, I've just laughed at. That's the end of the quick fire uh, get to know Max. I've just nearly thought this was part of it. It says, I don't know if you've ever, if I've ever mentioned it before, but I won my first BTCC race at my home circuit at Alton Park. Home wins are always that bit extra special, aren't they? Just how much did it mean to you uh, to win a cough? We've answered that. You're not. And, and Tony written this script. He put Cleo Trophy. I was thinking, What's that? I don't remember Max <laughs> being in some rubbish track day trophy thing. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, yours, yours was Alton Park, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it has it has it genuinely as a question from me to you. Has it has been anything that's ever been better than that in terms of how you felt? No. No. For for me, absolutely. Not. There's a real sad part to it, is that I don't think I will ever feel that good again, unless like my first touring car win was at Croft, or maybe won the championship but I'm not sure I will ever feel as good as I felt that day. It's a really difficult thing to get over. Can I tell you something, mate? Um, there has been two times where I've got close to it. Yeah. <clears throat> One of them was a year and a bit later when I won at Snetterton. And it, it, it was a different kind of buzz. Yeah. But it was, it was the closest I got to it. And then this is really, really weird. And Tony's gonna hate it, and everyone else will laugh, and they'll hate it too. But you know when I, you know when I did that golf ball thing, and I caught the golf ball in the yeah. Guinness World Record. Yeah. There's a video where the the emotion from myself and Marcus, who unbelievably Marcus the golfer won his first tour uh, at Germany. It's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I've actually got some great messages on my phone. I'll show you it, but. When you see the emotion in my face, 
and I remember it, the ball dropping in and achieving something. And it's just a golf ball dropping in a car. Let's yeah. be honest. It reminded me, Max, of when I won at Alton because I'd, it had been that long since I, do you know, when you let yourself go and you're yeah. like, you can see in my eyes, I'm looking to, I'm like, oh, what's happened? And it's that emotion. And that's what keeps you racing yeah. and me searching for that elation. It's amazing. When you've had that feeling, you just want to have it again. And yeah. like, I watch the video back sometimes of, of my reaction to winning that race. And I go absolutely berserk. Like, I am shouting for half a lap. So not until I get down, like most of the way down the back straight before I've took like a breath. Like I am so, so happy. Um, yeah. And like, I, I remember coming into the complex and they used to have a big screen on the right hand side as you entered into the left. And I remember it cutting to like my dad and I started crying then. I so nearly crashed twice before I got to the line. <laughs> I locked up the last corner. It was going digga, 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 digga. And I nearly put a wheel on the grass because I just like, I was looking at the screen instead of what was going on. So, um, but yeah, that, that is, I don't know how we got onto that, but yeah, that's, that's like a cool feeling. I can't remember. The, the elation, you know, no, no, no. But the elation that you'll have, mate, when you win those kind of races, it doesn't actually matter what, it actually does not matter what level of racing you're into. Because people yeah. in Formula they want to look at touring cars and just laugh. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I know where I stand, but when you and me and Sarah and people who drive race cars get to the to that level that they're at and go beyond it and win, it's just yeah. there's no other feeling. I, I can't explain to people how amazing it is, and you've got to be. And that's why I always say to people, new winners in touring cars or new winners in anything, I always say, always, always, always hang on to that moment and mm. leave it to the last minute to leave. Like I did not get out of my touring car for five minutes because I knew as soon as I got out, I would kind of forget what was going on. I had five minutes to myself and Alan Hyde was fuming because he was waiting to interview me <laughs> in the collected area. And the TV was live with Vicky Butler Henderson. And for me, you just got to remember, you know, those things don't come around too often. And that's no. the way it is, isn't it? No, I've, I've been going for 27 years and it's happened once. So it shows you that it doesn't, um, doesn't, doesn't happen that, that often. And that's what makes it great, mate. And that's what yeah. will make it even better. And that's what the kind of reactions you'll see, like Marcus Armitage winning his first ever tour and dedicating it to his mum who he lost 20 years ago. It's Your memories just come back and you remember why you keep doing it. So, Absolutely. yeah, you're dead right, mate. Um, right, it's that time where we throw under the bus one of the nicest people that you will ever meet by giving him the crappest ever quiz questions to ask us people. Um, Chris, how are you, lad? You've been, have you got Runcorn Bridge in the background? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it's from, uh, from Witness, I believe. Why have you got my hometown bridge in the background, mate? It, it, it's a theme thing, because obviously you're now a, a well-known Channel 4 personality <laughs> you know the best bit about that is chris i can hear your dad in the background chatting telling to shut up if that's him <laughs> it's all right you can't see them anyway this is why we have the background so nobody else can be seen although that doesn't mean they can't be heard hey i would laugh if your dad alan just popped up behind that brick wall which is actually the river mersey oh, i'm signaling them down i'm signaling them down let's see it, it, there he is. <laughs> hey, Chris, it's like the Loch Ness Monster, but scarier. <laughs> right, my man. How's your quiz looking, Captain? Um, I sent it you today, but I never look at them because that would be unfair. Is it? Is it for me and Max? Uh, yeah, it is. It's for you. It's for Max and yourself, Paul O'Neill. And then, of course, the right. thing, um, Max and Owen, which sounds like I'm a, a comedy duo from Leicestershire. Um, but it just, it just does that. for some reason no offence intended um, and uh, obviously Max the rules are it's um, just just answer them if you know the answer to them just shout out if you know the answer to them okay um, and there's five questions so it's not like and there's and there's no prizes or anything well there is prizes you get awarded for po points for getting the answers right but there's no like million pound giveaways or anything this isn't this isn't Jeremy Clarkson yeah um, 
Right, okay. question one. Um, Max Fried, I believe that's actually how his name is pronounced, is of course one of Paul's favorite basketball, baseball stars. But which team does he play for? Is it A, the New York Yankees, B, the Atlanta Braves, or C, the Michigan Melts? Michigan Melts. Team Hard. <laughs> you say Team Hard there, man. I have no idea. B, what did you go for? Um, I went for Michigan. I went for Michigan. B. But, uh, I'm, afraid it's, I'm afraid it's from Atlanta, the Atlanta Braves. Was that big? I'll award a half point to Paul for that because he was because he, he was close. He was on the baseball team, so I got continent. I've never heard of the player or any of the teams. Yeah, I'm not even sure his surname's pronounced correctly. I, I, I don't know. I, I, well, it's a crap quiz, and that's, <laughs> it, it's just funny because it is. <laughs> Question two. This one should be a bit easier. Max Boyce was once a famous TV comedian dash singer, but which vegetable did he regularly appear holding? I'm serious, he appeared with a vegetable on television. But what was it? Was it A, a cucumber, B, B a broccoli, or C, a leek? B, broccoli. Leek. <laughs> you got it correct, Paul. I'm sorry, but yes. we're nearly there, but Paul's got it. It is C, a leak. And the reason is he had a leak with him because he's from Wales. And that's the... Na <laughs> I know, I know, Max, I can understand your, right. your concern. Why anybody would carry a leak on national television, I have no idea. I should just whap up a Yorkshire Rose in the middle of our next interview. <laughs> uh, yeah, that could be a trend, actually. Yeah. <laughs> right. This one. This one should be should be much easier. It's motorsport stuff now. Question three: Max Verstappen, who is by the way the current leader of this year's Formula One World Championship, was born in which year? A. 1996. B. 1998. Or C. 1997. 1998. B. Oh, you're close there, Paul. Can you say the same thing. Or have you just told me that's wrong? <laughs> that was wrong. Uh, 97. You're correct, Max. You've got it. 1997. Whoa. Which was, that's, that's a point to you. And that was, of course, I believe 97. That was the year the WRC car first made an appearance in the World Rally Championship mm. when the regulation came out. Looking for. Um, uh, Paul's pretty much hinted at this one already, sort of. As we all know, Marcus Armitage recently gained a Guinness World Record for driving a golf, a golf ball 300 yards and, and hitting a retired racing driver sat in a BMW convertible. But how much money did Marcus earn last Sunday when he won his first European Tour event? Was it A, 75000 495 euros. Yeah, this is quite specific, the amount. B, 125,500 euros. Or C, I know it's just so specific there. C, 179,000. C, 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 C. You got it, Paul. You got it. All the money. Done that, but you got it. 179,670 euros. Which That's because you showed me the check. <laughs> which I believe translates to an awful lot of Cronenberg, I believe. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a David Mitchell joke, sorry. <laughs> uh, question five. Max, Paul and Jack Banyan have all completed the Great North Run. But this is the question, the real important question, who was the quickest? Max Coates. And yes, yet. Paul, yes, Paul you've, you've beaten him to it again. It was Max Coates. And apparently, according to many reports, it was by about half a day. <laughs> <laughs> you had to carry Steve Ride around, didn't you? You had to give him a piggyback. So that's all oh my word to Paul on that front. 
some uh, well done, Mr. O'Neill. And um, actually, before I hand over to Tony, I just wanted to point this out uh, on Max's point about the spectators thing being back. I remember watching the Indy 500, uh, I think was it last Sunday, and they had about 135,000 people there. And I know I watched it on TV, but that to me was a sure sign that things were going to get better because it was, it was just amazing seeing those fans back and hearing them cheering when Helio Castro Neves won his fourth title. It was just unbelievable. Thank God. We like that. Uh, so we like that. Uh, yeah, I'll be in the back of... Follow yeah. the memes page on Instagram and see the reaction of the crowd when Turing, when Plato and Sutton were at each other at SNET. Oh, yeah. like the same vibes as that. That was on the other day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, good. Um, uh, I believe it's over to Tony now. Thanks, Chris. As ever, um, a wonderfully crap quiz. Um, I've got to mention, just whilst it's up there, the, the effort that you put into those backgrounds. That picture of me and Mr O'Neill, um, I know I take the mick out of him a lot, but getting a phone call to spend the day with him at Alton Park and having a passenger lap in... Uh, a BMW being driven by Mr. O'Neill round at Alton Park on the slicks was, uh, it was a, it would have been a magical moment anyway, but he knew at the time I was going through an incredibly rough patch. Uh, and whilst I've got lots of smiles there that were very genuine, um, it meant a hell of a lot that day. And every time I see that photo, uh, it brings back a lot of really good memories. Um, so, yeah, some of, some of us can be smiling on the outside, but uh, you never know what's going on in the inside of folks. But uh, that was a magical day. And, yeah, I do like to take the mick out of Owe at every possible moment. But that was a brilliant day and uh, one that I will never forget. So I will say it publicly. Thank you, Paul. That was an absolutely fantastic day that uh, just meant an awful lot to me. Um, and particularly being able to drive a lap quicker than you on the data logging, that was fantastic. Uh, anyway, right, this is the time of day where we open the microphones up, uh, which is always a little bit scary. Um, we're actually really hoping that when Ian gets back into the room again, we're hoping that he actually has his camera on, um, because we were just going to sit and watch him for about a minute and just leave him on YouTube. Uh, to the suggestion of Rob Marsh, which I thought was a masterful idea. But unfortunately, Ian's not got his camera on. Why? I'll, I'll send him a I little... Know, story behind it with, with Ian. He, I don't know whether he's still listening to this, but there's, there's a monkey on the side of my helmet about here. Um, and that's... Um, Ian did a, did a bit of sponsorship with me last year. So when we were... Me and Creasy went into the, the Jeff's campsite and we did that radio one what i don't know what it's called um innuendo bingo and we were like spraying each other it's probably where covid started but um like the so when when we come back out this um i'm sure it was ian and he he, he, he collared me and he went can i just do a can i just ring somebody and it was his missus who just said that i look like a monkey or something and we had we had like me on facetime and she was like so she didn't know what to say it was really, really funny. Um, but anyway, it was, it was all good because he ended up sponsoring me and now there's a monkey on my helmet. So there you go. <laughs> Black story Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Darren, I believe you've got a question for, uh, for Max. Yeah, hi, Max. Uh, actually, I've got two screens. Um, if you, it's just because of the way I am. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. I've got you there. Okay, yeah, I've got one for audio and one for, one for visual. Uh, when you when you were saying earlier about uh, Janetta's that if you can buy get someone else to buy the car you yeah. can afford to do it that kind of that made me think because I've I've never understood what's in it for somebody to get into or to be associated with motorsport yeah uh, then you were talking about um, uh, I, I guess doing presentations of people saying I want 100 grand to go racing uh, and this is how I can make it work for you. I don't want to be too intrusive, so if I am, just say shut up, Darren, <laughs> and I will. But how how does that how does that work? Because I've never really understood it. Yeah, so actually, a few of my deals have been done a little bit like that. Actually, so there's you obviously need a car to go racing, 
Um, and then you've got the cost of running it, which, you know, principally being on, on token package at uh, a support level is um, entry fees, tires, fuel, um, upkeep of the car. So like parts to put on it, like brake discs, um, oil, brake fluid, brake pads, that sort of thing. Um, a team fee and um, crash damage. Um, there's ways that you can reduce some of them. So you can do work on your own car to reduce the team fee. You can not crash so much, which is a very easy thing to say, but isn't always practical. But, you know, there are there's people who are shunters and there's people who are not. So don't crash. Um, you can put less tires on it, but then you go slower. So it is a little bit of a lesser of two evils. And you can put less stuff on the car. So you can make a set of brake pads last two meetings or you can make it or you can change them every race and you'll get a few benefits out of it. So there's ways that you can make the budget smaller. There's also ways that you can make the budget bigger. And the other thing that I've not mentioned there is, is doing any testing. So you can you can add a great lump of budget on there. But um, essentially, to, at the starting point, there's probably a um, on most things like Clio Cup up to something like Ginetta Super Cup, there is probably between 10 and probably 20, 25 grand worth of um, car rental. So if you can get somebody to buy the car and it doesn't depreciate anything, they essentially give you like a, an interest-free loan. You have an asset that's worth an amount of money. And then at the end of it, you sell it and they get the money back. So it's a way of being able to negate some of that cost. And it that's happened with me, with the Ginetta Junior. Um, it then ended up happening with me with the with the Clio. Um, a weird story around that. We actually bought a Ginetta first, and then I had to call that person and say, I don't want the Ginetta anymore, I want a Clio. So that happened. Uh, it was very difficult. Hi, Mum. I don't know whether she wants to be in. I she doesn't want to be in. Um, so yeah, so the ways to like, you know, go about buying buying a car, which then reduces your, the costs of, of running it. So, um, yeah, that's one of the ways that we've done it with the Ginetta Junior. Um, we never did it with any of the other Ginettas, and then we've done that twice since with Clio's, and it's worked really well for me. Go ahead. Thanks, Wayne. No problem. Cool. Just scrolling through a few of the questions. Uh, how do you find racing the Mini compared to the Clio in terms of handling and performance? Um, performance wise, it's faster. Um, it is not as consistent as what the, the Clio was. I definitely enjoyed that part from the Clio. Um, I think the racing was maybe slightly better in the Clios because the, the Minis have a, a center exit exhaust, which means that it's really difficult to get as close to another car because the engine overheats. So there's, there's positives and negatives from, from both sides. Um, but I, I definitely do miss do miss racing the players. They're great fun. Um, Rob Marsh. Um, apparently, he used to be a quicker runner than you, Max, uh, which yeah. is a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? Because I think Creasy said that and found himself entered into the Great North Run. Yeah, but he never did it. No, not yet. Neither did Adam Morgan, just for the record. He was going to do it, wasn't he? And then, he? and then Danny Buxton did it for him and was rapid. Yes, yes, and Adam Morgan remains yeah, the fastest right. British touring car driver in the Great North Run, however it was Danny Buxton. <laughs> well, I had no idea. The problem was, when I did the Great North Run, I'd done all my training in kilometres, and then as we set off, Strava clicked to miles, so I suddenly didn't have a clue how fast I was running. So I thought, I'll just try and follow Danny, which I managed to do for, like, a mile and a half, <laughs> and then I'm, like, I'm, I'm broken. Hey, I've still got Max. six miles to go. Max, can I, you know, you. Were, I just want to tell you this little story uh, that people won't know about, that only me, Max and Tony know about, about the Great North Run. If you watch British touring cars, you guys do not understand and are only going to find out now how close you were to wearing black armbands for the death of Steve Ryder. I'm going to tell you this now because you, you're good friends and we're in a little chat room. Steve Ryder nearly died that day. <laughs> so, joking apart, me and Steve-O have set off well steady. The man's, well, how old Steve? 71? So he would have been about 68 back then. Anyway, 
Steve keeps saying to me, oh, mate, you crack on, you know, you crack on. I was saying to him, mate, I asked you to come and do it. Tony loved the fact that you're doing it. He got us loads of great coverage. Gabby Roslin, everybody wanted to speak to him. He got BBC prime time in the morning and he kept saying, you know, mate, you crack on. I was like, no, absolutely not. I'll stick with you to the end, Steve. In other words, mate, this pace is great because I'm in a bad way already and we're only three miles in. Anyway, we get to going. Steve starts to have this weird, like, look about him that he does not really about 10. I think it was about eight, nine miles in. He wasn't really listening to me anymore. He'd had enough. And I thought, that's cool. That's what a lot of people are like. Girls on dates, ex-girlfriends, whatever. Steve Ryder is your only human. So anyway, I, th- I was a bit concerned about him because we. he said, right, we're going to have to walk now. And I was like, that's absolutely fine. Thank God. Only a mile and a half to go. We walked the last mile and a half. And it was so hot that day. And really hot. we all got back and we ca- it was really hot when it... And we got back, didn't we, Max? Yeah, and um, and that, like the biggest death toll ever in Great. Is that right? Yeah, it was. It was really, really hot. Oh, I wouldn't have made a joke, but I didn't know that, mate. No. Anyway, Steve didn't die, so that that's all that matters. Anyway, so <laughs> Sorry. we ended up. So we ended. We ended up getting back to the tent. It's like a hospitality tent, and I got, I got in. It's like Steve, do you want a drink? And he was like, Yeah, yeah, no worries. Got him a, a John Smith. And he sat there, and I'll always remember it. it. was in this tent. You know how hot tents get? And he's there drinking this John Smith's. And I'm like, I asked him a load of questions, and he was just staring at this John Smith. Anyway, long story short, he was massively dehydrated. We didn't really realise, and I got him a water. I was like, you're all right, Steve? And he went, no. And got me and – was you there, Max? I don't know if you were. Me and, me and a couple of lads had to get him out, got him outside, and they were really concerned about him. So the, the bouncer guy – rang well got on the par- got to the paramedics on the radio and steve was like just lying there on the thing but so funny because i went steve come on mate the paramedics are here and they had a wheelchair and stuff and i tried to grab this john smith out of him and it was like a, it was like the terminator grip he just held on to this john smith put his fingers through it and wouldn't let it go and he was like not now o'neill and i was like oh god when will that proper de- demonic on me anyway he gets him in this he gets him in he gets him in this in this wheelchair and then it ends up in the red cross it was like the iraq i went in there i'm looking for like steve ride i'm a tv dad i'm like you can't die today not on my watch and um anyway i was waiting for about an hour and then someone got me one of our team got me and went oh steve's back in he, he only was in there for 15 minutes and they brought him back through and then he was there finishing off with john smith's so he was definitely he was just massively dehydrated and um yeah that, john smith that's my that's my story that's my story of Steve Ryder and how close you were to having me probably present the whole thing. <laughs> it was really, really close. I remember trying to find you for ages. <laughs> I've still got those beers from it that you all got. That was really cool. good times. Sorry, Tony. I, I cut across you there and uh, yeah, I just thought you'd want to know that. Yeah. He's still alive, which is good. Yes. Still going. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that all was sparked by Rob Marsh claiming to be a quicker runner at some point in his life. It's kind of traditional, Max, that we, we do leave the final question uh, to Rob. There's never any pressure on him. He never has a question prepared. It normally takes about five minutes of questioning before he finally gets muted. But um, over to you, Rob. <laughs> what? Hello, hello, Max. Hi. Uh, Max can actually verify that I was quicker than him, but I think I was probably still in my thirties. And there's no way that I'm going to do the Great North Run because that, that, that last morning is stopping. What, what's your fastest ever kilometer? Oh, I don't know kilometer. Um, I did a mile in five thirty-seven, uh, and a five k in twenty minutes and thirty. I'm not sure I can do that in a clear around Snetterton. But that's when, that's because I was like working towards the sub, sub 20 before I hit 40 and I got sciatica and then I let everyone know about it for a good few months because nobody's ever had sciatica before, only me. And then since then, I think I've done one run. It was about two miles, which was quite quick as well, but it just annoyed me. I get pissed off with the fact that I'm really good at running because I hate it. <laughs> so there you go. As well, and I'm slow, so then it takes longer, and then it yeah. Takes. But you you finish a run, and you'll be smiling. And I finish a run, and I'm just trying not to die. Only for a like pic- what Paul said, 
go know about him because he's selfish. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I have one question for Max and one for Paul. I'm sorry for taking up the time. The question for Max doesn't come from me. It comes from someone else. And I think it's kind of been covered by Tony already, but she ain't going to listen to all of it. So you might as well just humour her. Just wait a minute. She lives in my phone. Can you see it? Hi, yeah. Uh... Wait. Hi, Max. When did you become a racing driver? Did you hear that? Yeah. When did I become a, a racing driver? Yeah. Because Squishy, Squishy is one of my... Uh... Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, Squishy is one of my biggest biggest bands, but more importantly, she's one of my best friends. That's right, isn't it, Rob? Yeah, she's a better friend to you than I am. I'm not unhappy about that whatsoever. Yes. Whatever. I don't need friends. I'm 41. Who cares about me? <laughs> You'll be my friend. Um, when did I become racing driver? I don't, I don't know. It's really, do you know what? It's a really difficult thing to know when you actually become a racing driver. Like, I still don't know whether I'd necessarily call myself. I can get paid to race. I, like, I get sponsorship and it somehow all keeps. Wait, so the other way, wait, wait, wait. Just so simplify it for Squish because you yeah. won't need to go into any detail. When, what was the first race where you thought, ooh, I'm quite good at that? Mm. And it, sometimes it would be nice. When I thought I was really all right, was, was, was Cleo Cup. I didn't miss that last bit, Cleo Cup at Croft. But probably probably like one of the winter series in Janetta Juniors um, in like 2010, 2011. Um, probably started to do all right then. And that was probably when I felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually all right at this. So, yeah, don't come straight away, though, that is for sure. Cool. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that on to her then. She probably won't even listen to that. She's... <laughs> Concentration span's worse than mine. If not, then we'll just have to do another FaceTime with, like, some horses on it or something. Oh, don't, yeah, don't don't offer that to her. She'll, she'll no. snap the phone on my hand. <laughs> Nearly broke my arm last time. Um, <laughs> right, OK. My second question was for Mr O'Neill. Hi, Paul. Nice to see you again. Um, it, it's kind of... It doesn't really link in with what you were saying about Steve Ryder, but um, Tony will be happy because we've covered your racing career. We mentioned the win again. Um, it's apparent that you've got a pretty famous sister. Is it Mel Z? Mel Z? She's not, she's not American. I don't but You've also got... Her either. <laughs> you've got... Um, is it diabetes? Have you got type 1 diabetes? Is that it, Tony? I can't remember. I can never remember. <laughs> He doesn't really like to talk about it, Rob. He doesn't mention it, does he? He never, no. never ever talks about it. Right. Okay. Right. So that's an incident then. Right. I've known, uh, I think you're the fourth type one I've ever known in my life. Um, two of them I don't like anymore. So watch yourself. <laughs> the people that I've known who've had that illness, and I know how much you can control your life, they had really regimented routines. And from seeing what you. Uh, put on Twitter today about your week. It's usually all over the place. How do you manage to stay on your feet every day? What a question. Um, I I subconsciously make sure I'm doing the right things in the right order, or try to. Like today, I've ridden 33 miles this morning, um, and when I to be fair, Rob, when I've done some kind of um, low impact, long cardio, <clears throat> like cycling, I know I'm pretty fine for the rest of the day then. Yeah, I've um, seen you mention the cycling. <laughs> but the only problem is though, Rob, to be fair, is um, it's like now, what time is it now? Is it half eight? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's half past eight and I haven't had my, my, my dinner yet. And that's, that's because I've had it, this this to me now is a normal this is a normal day like max said we don't we don't we usually get in about now like because of where we live so i have to be careful i don't just dart into a um service station and eat a load of carbs and a load of rubbish and it skyrockets me so i have to just make sure i plan a bit further ahead than somebody who doesn't have the condition um so it is and do you know what's really funny rob I did something for Medtronic um, the other day on my Instagram. Um, it's a diabetic company that that have a lot of stuff that they're gonna they're gonna send to me. And I did something called the Blue Balloon Challenge, 
and they give me this blue balloon and I had to just bounce it up in the air and talk about how difficult it, it yeah. was having diabetes. You know me, mate. I actually don't think it's that hard, if I'm dead honest. Like, I, I really don't think it's that difficult. You can make it difficult by being an absolute like pisshead or being someone who just doesn't eat properly or whatever. But d- doing that with the balloon, it was the best analogy that I... I had never even thought of it like that because... I do have to think about stuff you probably haven't seen, but I've just done six units of insulin because I know I'm going to eat in about 15 minutes' time. Thank you, Hannah Bevan's mum and dad. Um, and that that's the thing. It's just thinking about it, mate, and going forward with it. But like I always say to people, one, it's like brushing your teeth. You just do it and you forget about it. But two, there's 68 billion million other things you can have wrong with you. Diabetes is just not one of them but it's so interesting to speak to people with the condition who struggle with it. Yeah. And I always make sure if I know them or know of them, I'm like, just give them my number. Let's have a chat. What's the deal? Why is it so difficult for you? I know. And I hope Shaz don't mind me saying this. We've spoken a bit because she, she was speaking um, about her, uh, uh, her diabetes and if she, she may have it. So it's, it's a difficult, difficult situation, but it's only as difficult as you make it. And everybody's different. And for me, I have the worst days ever, the worst days ever, and then I have the best days ever. So, yeah, if you know where you're going, it's fine. But the racing really hindered me. I, I cannot tell you. People do not know what I went through in 9, 10, 11, driving that Integra for two years and that Chevrolet cruise. I can say this now. I went off on a qualifying lap because I was hypoing with a low blood sugar, and my my team boss nearly killed me. Like He said, if you ever go out again, because Max will know this, when you come in to do a diagonal cross, so you've got your front tyres on, you're getting them hot and you put your rear tyres on the front to make them uh, a bit warmer and you do the cross to, to give your balance across the front axles with the tyre heat. You do that in qualifying and then you just have to go. It's first lap, that might be a quicker. Second lap will definitely be a quicker. I was hypoing and never should have went out and I shouldn't probably really say it <laughs> here to, for general knowledge, but it was 10 years ago and it taught me a massive lesson because I nearly... I nearly killed myself and I nearly written the car off. And that, that was the first weekend of the year that would have destroyed my season. So you've got to be true to yourself and just make sure that you're, you're on top of it. And, um, you know, there's a way out of every single situation in life, not just, not just diabetes. Sorry, that was long winded. It was, you muted now, mate. <laughs> um, Rob. Well, I just had well, one more thing, sorry, because they were like, they were almost serious questions. Sure. Just one more thing about, about Paul and his famous sister. You might have to unmute him again. You know when that 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 goat fucked off. Where did you think it had gone? I didn't have a clue. I didn't have, <laughs> you know what? You know what's really bad about that? The only I've seen that film back in 1993, Jurassic Park, but. I knew what was coming when they turned the head around. I've seen so many different cuts of that video and memes. I, I knew what was going to happen, but I honestly didn't know where the goats had gone. I forgot that dinosaurs are actually quite vicious and horrible things, aren't they? Not great. No, they're rubbish pets. <laughs> right, you're both muted because I've got a frozen screen of Max and it's the first time I've not seen him smiling. He needs his tea. Um, right, before we finish, finish, Max, this weekend, uh, racing at Snetterton, uh, it's been a while. Um, you've just won the first race. Do you want to thank all your sponsors before we wrap up? Uh, no, I'd like to thank Positive Pit Stop instead. They've been they've been far more useful. So um, yeah, good. Excellent. Good luck, right. no. well, <laughs> good luck hey, Matthew. Before we go, I, yeah. this, it might make somebody's day. This is a podium cap from last year. Just you want to work out some way that one of these people can have it, and I'll get it sent to him. Oh, Whatever, I don't know, a creative way of working out who needs it. If it gives you a pick up, then then I'll get that sent out to you next week when I get back from snap. Well, I'll tell you who'll need it if it's sunny at Snetterton. It's that guy. Green. It's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's really lovely of you. Um, yeah, we'll work something out, Max. Thank you. I like a massive knob in one of these. So <laughs> I, hate, I hate wearing these. So, um, yeah, somebody else can have it. <laughs> We're after a raffle. <laughs> or it's one of my um, bucket lists to get one this year. But you put it in the raffle. 
Well, I think I think that probably answers the question then, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Get it sorted. Brilliant. Yeah. Massive Thank thanks, massive thanks to you, Max, for your, all your time. Um, thanks to Paul for um, yeah telling us about his diabetes and his world record and his win at Alton Park. I think you've ticked them all off the list this week. Well done. Um, you forgot to say his sister's famous. Well, That's actually, it. if you tune tune in to Channel Four on Friday night, nine pm. Celebrity goggle box plus Paul O'Neill. <laughs> and if that doesn't fill you with deep joy, tune into ITV4 on Sunday and you can see hours and hours of Mr. O'Neill, Max, and everyone else who's down there at Snesterton. So for once, I'm going to sign off and say enjoy the rest of your week and good luck to Max on Sunday. Good luck to Paul on Friday night. <laughs> Let's see what goes on there. And Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Have a great one. Good luck, Maxi. Thanks very much. <laughs>